We humans are kind of funny because sometimes we deliberately expose ourselves to very stressful situations. And today I'm referring to deliberate heat exposure, specifically the sauna. Now saunas, or deliberate heat exposure, have actually been around for thousands of years. But over the past few years is getting even more attention in the health and fitness world due to some of the claims that sauna use can stimulate certain health and fitness adaptations. There are claims that it can aid with detoxification, recovery, and even provide some remarkable cardiovascular benefits that may improve health and lifespan. So today, we're going to take a look at the brain and other body structures and learn how they respond to heat, which will then help us to find out how much truth there is to these sauna-related health claims. And of course, discuss the sauna protocols you can utilize to reap some of these benefits. It's clearly going to be a hot one. So let's jump into this anatomical and physiological awesomeness. Now before we talk about any potential benefits of sauna or heat exposure, we should probably understand how the body actually responds to heat. Pretty much all of us have a sense and understand to some level that our body wants to keep its core temperature within a fairly narrow range, within about plus or minus one degree of your normal core temperature. Skin temperature, in contrast to core temperature, can actually vary much more as it rises and falls with the temperature of the surroundings. And we are going to see that the skin plays an important role in all this in just a second. But this process of maintaining core body temperature is known as thermoregulation. Now there is some variation from person to person on what the normal core body temperature is, but the average is considered to be between 98.0 to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 36.7 to 37 when converted to Celsius. And again, the body works hard to maintain your normal core temperature, and it utilizes some beautifully designed mechanisms in order to accomplish this. As I mentioned just a second ago, most of the time core body temperature is maintained within about plus or minus one degree of your normal. But when someone exercises or is outside on a very hot day, or maybe someone is deliberately exposing themselves to a sauna, body temperature can rise temporarily to as high as 101 degrees Fahrenheit to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is when some of these incredible mechanisms kick in. There is an awesome structure in the center of the brain called the hypothalamus that you can see here. And this is in charge of maintaining homeostasis throughout the body. And part of maintaining homeostasis is maintaining proper body temperature. So as the temperature rises, the hypothalamus receives input from temperature receptors, also known as thermoreceptors. And these thermoreceptors are located in various structures throughout the body, such as the skin, spinal cord, and certain internal organs. Plus, the hypothalamus itself has a large number of heat-sensitive neurons. And so as the hypothalamus receives this input about the temperature rising, it immediately engages certain temperature-regulating mechanisms. And this is where the skin comes in. Now, you might have immediately thought of sweating when I mentioned the skin, and yes, sweating is a major part of thermoregulation, but there's also something else within the skin that occurs besides sweating, which is extremely cool, and yes, I'm definitely going to say that pun was intended, but the skin has an incredible blood supply, and what happens when core temperature starts to rise is that the blood flow into the skin can be increased dramatically. And this is accomplished through what is known as vasodilation, which is the widening of the blood vessels, meaning the diameter of the tube increases. And this will therefore increase the amount of blood flow to the skin. And this increased rate of flow to the skin causes heat to be conducted from the core of the body to the skin and ultimately conducted to the air, cooling the body with great efficiency. And when I say efficient, let me give you some more context. If you were to compare a fully vasoconstricted state of the skin blood vessels to a fully vasodilated state of the skin blood vessels, you would see an approximate eight-fold increase in heat conductance from the core to the skin when those blood vessels are fully vasodilated. And this amount of blood flow to the skin can account for as much as 30% of the total cardiac output. And cardiac output is a measure of the total volume of blood pumped out of the heart in one minute. And keep this in mind for a little bit later when we talk about the possible cardiovascular benefits of sauna. But clearly, the skin, with its ability to change the rate of blood flow, is an effective cooling tool for your body. And as long as skin temperature is greater than the temperature of the surroundings, heat can continue to be lost or dumped to the cooler surrounding environment by this mechanism. But when the temperature of the surroundings becomes greater than that of the skin, 
The only means by which the body can continue to rid itself of heat is by adding another cooling mechanism through evaporation. And so, of course, we need to talk a little bit about sweat. And with all this talk about sweating and heat exposure, it is important to have a supplement that replenishes vital nutrients and supports whole body health. And this is where the sponsor of today's video comes in, and that is AG1. AG1 is a daily foundational nutrition supplement backed by research studies, and it's packed with multiple vitamins, minerals, and adaptogens. It also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes that support gut health, which has led to a small pro and con for my family. The pro is, this has helped keep my family members' bowel movements a bit more regular. The con, I know about the regularity of my family members' bowel movements. But in a recent research study, AG1 doubled the levels of healthy gut bacteria. These healthy bacteria help break down food, alleviate bloating, aid in digestive comfort, and obviously, in my experience, promote digestive regularity. And so it's definitely nice to see that AG1 is constantly putting their formula to the test to ensure continuous improvement. Another thing I love about AG1 is that it has a comprehensive formula. And instead of needing to add more supplements, I get everything I need in one easy scoop. So if you're interested, right now AG1 is offering a surprise limited edition gift on top of the welcome kit when you subscribe. It won't last long, so go to drinkag1.com slash humananatomy or scan the QR code to get started. Thanks again for AG1 for sponsoring today's video. And now, back to sweating and saunas. To initiate sweating, the hypothalamus will send nerve impulses through autonomic pathways down through the spinal cord and then through sympathetic nerves to the sweat glands that are located in the skin pretty much everywhere throughout the body. This will activate the sweat glands, causing them to produce sweat that will eventually make it to the surface of the skin. And as the sweat evaporates, this will cool the body. Now, that likely isn't shocking to you, as we've all known that sweat helps to cool the body down, but there are some fun facts about sweat that you might not know. A person that is unacclimatized or unadapted, which would be someone that doesn't exercise often or isn't exposed much to hot and humid environments, this person would seldom be able to produce more than about one liter of sweat per hour. However, when that person exposes themselves to a hot environment from anywhere from one to six weeks and or starts to consistently exercise, the sweat glands will adapt and begin to sweat more profusely, often increasing maximum sweat production to as much as two and sometimes even as high as three liters per hour. And evaporation of this much sweat can remove heat from the body at a rate more than 10 times the normal basal rate of heat production. And this increased ability of the sweat glands to produce more sweat comes from changes of the cells in the sweat gland, as well as an increase in the size of the sweat gland. Something else that also changes with sweat is the amount of salt in the sweat. Someone that is unacclimatized when they first are exposed to those hot environments and or intense exercise, and they start to sweat profusely, they could potentially lose as much as 15 to 30 grams of salt per hour. But after about four to six weeks of acclimatization or adaptation, the loss may only be as low as three to five grams per day. So from a practical exercise perspective, the acclimatized or adapted person is holding on to their electrolytes more effectively. So now that we know how the body responds to heat, are there any major benefits to deliberately exposing the body to heat like in the form of a sauna? Now, I'm sure most of you know what a sauna is and have even been in one before, but if you haven't, it is essentially a small room or space designed to expose your body to what you could kind of think of as a more dry heat, typically reaching temperatures between 140 degrees Fahrenheit to as high as 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But as we'll see in just a minute, the average temperature that people are seeing many of the benefits of sauna are in the mid 170s. Now clearly, this is going to stimulate the mechanisms of vasodilation and sweat that we just talked about. But what are the specific health benefits of doing this? And are these benefits significant enough for you to even include the sauna in your routine? Well, often people will say the sauna can improve circulation, enhance detoxification, provide relief to sore muscles, and some are now saying that it has cardiovascular benefits potentially reducing the risk of heart attack and other cardiovascular related diseases. So let's go through some of these claims. And let's start with detoxification. And I'm going to try to not get on too much of a soapbox here, but the claim is that the sauna could detoxify the body due to sweating out waste products. And it is true that certain waste products are found in the sweat, such as urea, uric acid, ammonia, lactic acid, and even certain heavy metals. However, this does not come close to what the liver 
and the kidneys can do for detoxifying the body. Those organs do the heavy lifting when it comes to detoxification. And the waste products found in the sweat are only found in small amounts. And so if the body gets elevated levels of some of these waste products, it's not like the body's like, uh-oh, activate all the sweat glands, and this person who is not even hot or working out starts sweating profusely just to get rid of the waste products. We know this doesn't happen because, again, the liver and the kidneys will handle this. The primary function of sweat is to cool the body. But yes, a small amount of waste products can come out with the sweat, so you could consider this a little extra additional benefit of sweating profusely in the sauna. But one thing that excessive sweating in a sauna could potentially be beneficial for is let's say we had an athlete that was training for an athletic event, and they were going to go run a half marathon or a marathon in a very hot and humid environment but they live in a more cold or more moderate environment where they're conducting most of their training. They could spend some time in a sauna in the weeks leading up to that race in a way to kind of pre-acclimate or heat adapt themselves to that environment that they're going to be racing in. Because remember, we saw that the sweat glands can modify and change from heat exposure. But let's actually talk about another claimed benefit from sauna use that actually is quite interesting, and this includes the potential cardiovascular benefits from the sauna. There are studies that have compared sauna use and aerobic exercise, and they did find some comparable improvements in the both groups. There have also been studies comparing people that exercised alone versus people that exercised and used sauna directly after exercising. And those that exercised plus used the sauna had even greater cardiovascular fitness with improved measurements in VO2 max. There are also other studies that show correlations with a reduction in the risk of death from cardiovascular disease with frequent sauna use. One in particular that I'll reference and I'll link in the description showed that after following up with these individuals 15 years later, they had a significantly lower risk of cardiovascular death with sauna use of four to seven times per week. Now, how could the sauna result in these cardiovascular benefits? And before you abandon your cardio routine, for just using the sauna, we'll also discuss some of the limitations of this. First, exposing the body to these high temperatures for about 20 minutes, as the 19 to 20 minute mark was kind of the sweet spot in many of these studies, but this exposure for 20 minutes would somewhat mimic the body's physiological responses to mild to moderate aerobic exercise. If you remember earlier, I mentioned that 30% of the cardiac output would go to the complete vasodilation of the blood vessels in the skin and this will result in an increased heart rate, plus being exposed to that much heat does induce a bit of a stress response, which also influences heart rate. And many people in the sauna can see that their overall heart rate could get into the 120s, and therefore close to the heart rate someone would experience when participating in moderate aerobic exercise. And we know that after consistently doing aerobic exercise, we see those health benefits of improved cardiovascular fitness with improved VO2 max, improved resting heart rate, improvements in blood pressure, and this overall risk reduction in cardiovascular disease. And so again, in a way, frequent exposure to the sauna is mimicking mild to moderate cardiovascular exercise. And for the studies where they compared the group that participated in only aerobic exercise versus the group that did the same aerobic exercise plus used sauna directly afterward, essentially what was explaining the further improvements in cardiovascular fitness and VO2 max was that the exercise plus sauna group was again, in a way, extending the workout or that cardiovascular stimulus for another 20 minutes. But there are limitations to this. If you were to say, just like sit in the sauna for your cardio and do nothing else, you could see some improvements in your cardiovascular health and fitness. However, this won't do much for you at the local level. And what I mean by that is at the skeletal muscle level. If you're running, cycling, doing a Stairmaster, rowing, swimming, or some other form of cardio, you're also going to be working and benefiting your skeletal muscles. And this will stimulate adaptations such as increased mitochondrial density within the fibers, increased capillarization to the fibers, and improvements in strength depending on the level of intensity. So obviously exercise is still going to be superior to the sauna alone, but you could get some extra benefits by going into the sauna directly afterwards. I kind of think of it as a form of heat intensive active recovery, you still continue to stimulate your cardiovascular system for 20 extra minutes or so, you still continue to get that increased blood flow, but you are discontinuing the strain 
on your muscles, connective tissues, and joints. This is also something that someone could consider doing if they had some sort of injury or disability that didn't allow them to participate in traditional cardio training. So what are some of the effective protocols for the sauna that you could incorporate into your routine? Well, ideally you would want to build up to about 175 degrees with about 10 to 20% humidity for 20 minutes, three to four times a week. Now, some of the studies did have people do this four to seven times a week, but seven times is kind of a lot, and you can still get many of these benefits doing it three to four times a week. Also, notice that I said build up. You will get heat adapted the more you do this, but it is always wise to start low and go slow, meaning you could start at a lower time and or lower temperature and build up from there. You obviously also want to be well hydrated before and after, so use common sense. But again, you can always build up by starting at the lower end first and then building up. And the last thing that I think is important to mention with all this is that a lot of the health and fitness channels out there, myself included, we sometimes get excited about these little health protocols. We tend to get all excited about cold plunging or sauna or some new research study. And so I do want to be very clear about something. Even though we talked about some of the potential benefits of sauna today, I don't want people to get the impression that this is the number one thing or number one priority on your health list. It's still the big four that need to be taken care of first, and that is a consistent and well thought out exercise program, balanced diet, sleep, and stress management. Then, once you've got a handle on those, start adding these little extras for some potential additional benefits. So thank you for watching today's video and supporting the channel. I've got some cool other videos linked here about sweating and cardiovascular exercise, and of course, I'll see you soon.